tutorial video on Unity 2023. So over a series of videos now, we've been learning more about how game objects, components, and systems interact. We understand that we create game objects within Unity. These have components, and those components are subscribed, get data from different systems. We also know we can add components. One of the things we've looked at in the last video is adding a scripting component, the ability to write code, and we use the c -sharp programming language to write that code. We saw when we worked over here in the hierarchy view for the square game object that we added a scripting component to this. We can see it right here in the inspector view right here, and in parentheses it says script. This is associated with a file. The file's over here in the project view called square. And then we saw when we edited this file that we were able to use debug.log, the log method of the class debug, to have messages show up in the console. So we can send messages to ourselves as developers, and that's not something a player would see. So let's spend this video talking a little bit more about the interactions between components, particular scripting components, and the game object it is attached to. So as a reminder, we're over here in the hierarchy view, selecting game objects, we're moving over here in the inspector view to deal with components. We're coming down here in the project view to work with project files, which might include C sharp programming language files. And we're sending messages to ourselves using the console view. So we're engaging the entire user interface layout within the unity editor to work with code. So I'm going to go ahead and double click on square. And it's going to up and open up Microsoft Visual Studio, which is the default editor for working with code in C Sharp with Unity. So in the previous example, we did two different things. We added line 10 and line 16. So we added home and we added looping. Well, in this video, we want to look at simple sprite movement. In order to do movement, we need to understand the relationship between a scripting component as a component and the game object it's attached to. In other words, we need to be able to get information from a system via a component and then do something with it as part of the methods, the kind of mini programs that we have available to us that are attached to other systems. We want to write some code that moves something. In order to do that, we need to understand all of these different relationships and their interconnectivity. So we saw in the previous video how the start method, this section right here, will only be run once as part of the initialization system, but update will be called every frame. And a frame is a kind of slice. If you imagine a train running in a circle, the tracks or the slices are the individual frames. And Unity usually runs at 60 frames per second. So 60 times per second, it's doing something. And we quickly saw that with the message looping within debug log was shown over 999 plus times in the console view. So we can very quickly generate messages for ourselves and sometimes get ourselves into trouble if we're not paying attention and understanding how these systems relate to each other. So for at least this time, I'm going to go ahead and highlight this right here and delete it. So. I want to move a sprite, and a sprite is just a kind of game object within Unity. And a couple of videos back, we created two sprites, the square and the circle that are part of the current scene. So this scripting component, this file right here, is attached to square, and I want to move square up on the screen. We'll look at other ways to move it, but I'm going to start with moving it up. So what is up? What does that mean to us in kind of programming terms? Well, remember that there are different templates of things we selected when we created a project way back in the first video from the Unity Hub. We had access to 3D Core, 2D Core, and a bunch of other templates. When I discussed those templates, I discussed them in terms of what we gave, what we get access to. In 2D, we have two different accesses. We have X and Y. And I talked about how we don't really use Z. The camera uses Z, but we don't usually do much with it. So we're interested in moving in X and Y. So if I want to move something up, I'm probably talking about Y. So 
x horizontal and y vertical. So I want to know where is the game object currently? So on this particular frame, where is it currently? Then I want to add a tiny amount to it. And then I want to visually see what that tiny amount means when we change it. So I need to know where is the current x position? Where is the current y position? Where is the current z position? Which is not terribly important, but we do need to know it. And then I want to change the y and then update the x, the y, and the z. So that's what we want to do. To do that, we need to engage with a couple other concepts that are part of the C Sharp programming language. C Sharp is among a family of languages that classifies any number that is a decimal number as something called a float, which seems a little strange at first. Why call decimal numbers, which we already have a word for in English, decimal, why call it a float? Where it takes its name from the decimal point. It floats around. It can move within the number. It floats within the number. And so many decades ago, it was renamed float, and that carries over into C Sharp as part of a family of languages building on each other. So I'm interested in a decimal number, the position of X and the position of Y, and I need to know float. Now, I've emphasized float because in C Sharp, Every data we use, every variable we use, has to have a corresponding type. And all of this means is, how much space does this take up in data? So within C Sharp, every type of data, so if I'm talking about a number versus the amount of something else versus the amount of something else, I need to know an exact number. And C Sharp has all of that built in, and by telling it a type, it allows it to optimize how the code runs. So what this means for us as developers is that everything will have a data type, so a type of its data. If we want a decimal number, we need a word called float. And notice as I typed it, it became blue, which tells it it's an important word within the language. So float, I'm gonna say float x, so we've got float space x, and I'm gonna write equal to, now, when we write programming, if you're coming to this for the first time, we write things a little strangely. We write on the left-hand side of the equal sign what we want something to result, what we want the result to be put in, and we write on the right-hand side where it's coming from. So it's coming from the right and ending up on the left. So I want a variable, something that can change, called x, of the type float to come from something. What it's coming from is something called a game object. Oh, a game object. Notice right here, the game object this component is attached to, a component is always attached to a game object. Well, of course that makes sense. A file right here is a scripting component and a component is attached to a game object. So game object with a capital O right here, is the attached game object, the thing we are attached to. We are a scripting component asking the game object we're attached to with a capital O in the middle there to give us some information. Well, I mentioned this in a previous video, but just as a quick reminder, every game object has a component. They all share a single same component, and this is called transform. The transform component holds the position, the rotation, and the scale. So if we are interested in the position of the current game object, where it is on the screen, then we can access it via its transform component. And this is something shared by all game objects. So I'm going to type game object dot transform and notice it's starting to anticipate where I'm going. So I'm gonna press enter transform. Now, what am I interested in? I'm interested in the position of something. So the position, Okay, now which position do you want? Do you want X, Y, or Z? I'm interested in X. And of course we end in a semicolon. So this says, find from the game object, its current position X right here, and save it over here as what's called a decimal, or put another way, a float value. 
And now I'm going to do the same thing for y. And notice it's anticipating where I might be going next. And it says, oh, do you mean game object dot transform dot position dot y? And I do, and if that's what I want, and sometimes it's not, but if that's what I want, I can press tab and it will assume I want all of those things that it tried to guess at. And I'm gonna do it one more time. And hey, it anticipated where I was going there as well. So we currently have X, Y, and Z of the current game object the scripting component is attached to. So I said I want to increase the Y value. So what I'm going to do is right here, I'm going to set my variable called Y to the current Y value plus something. And I want to add a very tiny amount. So let's say like 0. 0001, a very, very small amount. Now, I've got this red squiggly line, which is telling me I've probably done something wrong, and I have. Whenever we deal with decibel numbers within C sharp, and this is fairly unique to C sharp, we need to make sure that we tell it this is a float number. So we have numbers, which might be whole numbers, and decimal numbers, which it calls floats. If this is a float number, a float value, then it needs to, at the very end, have the lowercase letter F. And now the red squiggly has disappeared. It's a little bit tricky in C sharp to remember, but this is a rule the language wants us to do. So anytime we have a decimal number with a floating decimal, a float number, we need to make sure we include a lowercase F at the end. So this says currently, get the current X for the game object, get the current y plus a very small amount as a float number, get the z as current disposition right here. Now what I wanna do is I wanna take this x, this y plus a tiny amount and the z, and I want to now move the game object. So what I want now is to go the other way around. So first I started with moving from getting something on the right and moving it to the left, and now I wanna take all those values I now have on the left and move them over to another right-hand side to now be assigned to the left. So in this case, we want to write it the other way around. So this time I want game object. What am I interested in? Transform. What am I interested in? Position. Now, notice it's anticipated I want equals new vector three and then in parentheses X, Y, and Z with a closing semicolon. It can be a little confusing when coming to programming in Unity or other tools for the first time to come across something called a vector. This borrows from mathematical terms. A vector is just a way of describing values within space. So we're interested in a vector right here, or in other words, a vector three, which just means three values. So three values as a collection of things, and this is a value in space. So again, positions in space. So new vector three, X, Y, and Z. Why are we using the word new here? Well, as I explained, C Sharp cares about the types of values, the data types. Whenever we're creating new collections of values, new classes, or working with them, we're going to be using the word new quite a bit because we're gonna create a new collection of values and then use that value. And this is very, very common within C Sharp. We will be using this pattern quite a number of times. So we're saying, give me a new collection, here are the values, and then we are assigning them, moving them from right to left. So in order, line 16 says, go get the current X position of the transform component of this game object. Line 17 says, do the same thing for Y, but add a very tiny amount of um, a floating or decimal number. Line 18 says, do the same thing for Z. And then line 20 says, change the game objects, transform position to a new collections of values within space, a vector three, three values for X, Y, and Z. What this is going to do is every time, every frame 
this will move the y value, the vertical up and down value, by a very tiny but noticeable amount. So I'm going to save this file, file, save, and move back to Unity, and then give it just a second to reload everything. Okay, so it reloaded everything for me, and we'll double check, got everything ready, there's nothing in the console, but I'm not showing any messages. And now we wanna click play, and we'll see what happens when we get the Y position and then add a tiny amount every frame. See it? The red square, ever so slowly, very tiny amounts per frame, 60 frames per second, 60 times a second, is adding a very tiny amount, a float amount to the sprite, moving it up the screen right here, very, very, very slowly. So what did we just learn from this example? One, we learned by increasing the Y value, things go up. We also learned that update is called, or that sec section of code is run every frame 60 times a second. So if we change this to a much smaller number, so for example, this, file, save, come back to Unity, give it a second to reload, there it goes, and then we ran it, it would run much faster. Its movement would, and then it ran right out of the camera. Its movement would be much, much faster. So by understanding how update is run and how fast it run, that is the number of times it's run per second, we can start to understand how movement works. Movement is over time. So update was called many, many, many times, and it added a tiny amount to Y each time, which moved it up. But notice the movement in total was over time. So let's come back and do something a little bit different. Let's say, and I'll add my zeros back, I also want to move x, 0 0.00, oops, there we go, 0, 0, 0, 1, and of course this is a decimal or what's called a floating point number, f. So I want to move x and I want to move y in positive directions. I'm going to go ahead and save this file. File, save. Let's come back over here to Unity. Now it's reloaded and I'm going to click play. And notice it's moving this direction up here, a northeast direction. So this is positive x and positive, or positive x right here and positive y. So what if we move to move a completely different direction? So let's subtract this time to get the other way around. And I will go to file, save. And we need to, of course, there it goes, wait for Unity to reload. So we want to move in the other direction. And now we're moving down here in the southwest direction. So northeast was positive x, positive y, and southwest is negative x, negative y. So this tells us something very interesting about how we move things within Unity. If we want to move things up the screen, we're interested in increasing the y value. If we're moving things down the screen, we are decreasing the Y value. If we're moving things to the right, it's positive X. If we're moving things to the left, it's negative X. So understanding sprite movement or just general game object movement is a matter of understanding not only movement over time, but also the direction we want things to move in in relation to space. So... We have three values, a vector three, x, y, and z, and we can move things among the x and y direction, are horizontal or vertical, by understanding them in relation to how unity understands them. So positive y up, negative y down, positive or negative x to the left, positive x to the right. And by changing these values as part of the update function or the update method, we can now move things around. So how do we do movement within Unity?
we can, as one approach, change the literal X and Y and Z positions. We didn't really mess with Z, but we could have in 3D space by changing their numbers. And every time this would update right here, called once per frame, and shift them around. However, we saw movement is over time. So, as we'll see in future videos, there are far easier ways to do this. But, what was important, and what this video in particular points out, is movement not only is over time, but our understanding of where movement is going, up, right, down, and left, is a matter of understanding which direction it's moving, X or Y, and then a positive or negative in relation to where it started. So, positive in one direction, negative in another. And when pairing them together, we can also move in diagonals. So, as we get into in a future video and start working with input, whether or not a player presses a button or not, we need to know, are we moving up on the X, down on the X? Up on the Y, up on Y, down on Y, and how does that relate to the relative position in which we started? All of which is connected to the transform component of game objects. All game objects has, have this transform uh, component with their position, rotation, and scale. I had to remember scale uh, as part of every game object. And so one of the ways we can do very simple sprite movement or any game object movement if we wanted to is by understanding the transform component, the transform system. They're all components talk to systems and then how we can move things in relation to different systems and scripting components. So, four lines of code within a single method, but incredibly important as a nexus of a number of different concepts we have now seen within Unity. We create game objects. They have components. Those components talk to systems we can add something called a scripting component to a game object. The scripting component allows us to write code. By writing this code, different sections of the code, different methods of the code are connected to other systems. By getting information from one component in code, we can affect other components in code, and then, because the systems run in a very specific order, give it new information and then have the system update based on this new information by understanding everything I've just covered in relation to time, we can create things like movement. By understanding update is called 60 frames per second, 60 times a second, we can then understand movement by changing values from one component, from one system to another system using code. And this becomes incredibly important as we build in complexity across these videos. We're interested in doing lots of things within 2D within Unity, but to do that, we need to understand, again, game objects, components, and systems, concepts to how all of these things interact, and increasingly, how we get data from one component and then work with a separate component as part of scripting in the C-sharp programming language as we work with Unity 2023. Lots of things going on, we're still using the same concepts, still building very slowly as we start to think about two-dimensional programming within Unity and building on this knowledge. Thanks for watching.